recording. There we go. Okay. So last week was chapter 10. Uh, we were introduced to a couple of the minor judges, Tola and Jer. Tola was from Issachar. He, uh, Issachar is one of the 12 tribes of, of Israel. And he judged Israel for 23 years and then he died. Jer did the same thing. He's from Gilead. He judged Israel for 22 years and then he died. And we learned that's all we know about both of them. They're, they're not uh, mentioned again in scripture. There's not a whole lot in history books outside of the, of the Bible. Uh, probably nothing at all, actually. Um, and then the remaining 12 verses of chapter 10 restarted that framework that we've been working on throughout the course of this study. Um, the, the first, the Israelites turned their backs on God and worship pagan gods. Um, and that's apostasy. And then God became angry and sold them into the hands of the Philistines and the Ammonites who oppressed the Israelites. Um, we'll find out tonight that there was a land dispute. And that's why the Ammonites don't like the Israelites. Um, but anyway, that oppression was the hardship that we've been talking about. Then next is the Israelites had to suffer. And when they had suffered enough, they moaned or they cried out to God to be rescued. And God tells them, turn to your pagan gods that you were worshiping. Uh, that Let them rescue you, which is something we haven't seen before in this study. Um, but they decide to give up the foreign gods, the pagan gods, and they start worshiping the Lord, their God, the, the one that brought them from Egypt into Israel. Um, and he can no longer stand to see them suffer. The chapter ends with the Ammonites and the Israelites preparing for battle with, and the commanders of the people of Gilead wonder who will lead them in the, the battle against the Ammonites. That's where chapter 10 ended. Anything from last week that you want to discuss or talk about? Okay. So, who is the rescue? That's what we need to know now. His name is Jephthah. Um, might have to start calling our pastor that. It's, that's pretty neat, Jephthah. <laughs> <laughs> Kind of like those uh, preachers that start hollering at you and banging the pulpit. They always put a ah on the end of what they're saying. <laughs> anyway, chapter 11, verses 1 through 11 is where we're going to start. Now, Jephthah, the Gileadite, the son of a prostitute, was a mighty warrior. Gilead was the father of Jephthah. Gilead's wife who bore him son oh, oh sorry Gilead's wife also bore him sons and when his wife's sons grew up they drove Jephthah away saying to him you shall not inherit anything in our father's house for you are the son of another woman then Jephthah fled from his br brothers and lived in the land of Tob outlaws collected around Jephthah and went raiding with him. After, the, after a time, the Ammonites made war against Israel. And when the Ammonites made war against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to bring Jephthah from the land of Tob. They said to Jephthah, come and be our commander so that we may fight with the Ammonites. But Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, you are not uh, are you not the very ones who rejected me and drove me out of my father's house? So why do you come to me now when you are in trouble? The elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, Nevertheless, we have now turned back to you, so you may go with us and fight with the Ammonites and become head over us, over all the inhabitants of Gilead. Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, 
if you bring me home again to fight with the Ammonites and the Lord gives them over to me, I will be your head. And the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, the Lord will be, the, will be witness between us. We will surely do as you say. So Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead and the people made him head and commander over them. And Jephthah spoke all of, all of his words before the Lord at Mizpah. All right. Anything in that before we get into the stuff? All right. Jephthah is the son of Gilead and a prostitute. Now, Gilead was the leader of uh, uh, an area, like a tribal leader at one point, had a lot of children. And uh, the Gil uh, Jephthah is the one that he had with a prostitute. Um, that's that, that speaks a lot about his birthright. Uh, he doesn't really have one. Um, and Jephthah is presented in contrast in this to Gideon and to Abimelech by the circumstances of his birth. Uh, if you remember, Gideon was the son of a, a fellow that ran the pagan temple. I can't remember his name at the moment. Um, but Abimelech was Gideon's son by a woman from Shechem. Um, but regardless, Jephthah got chased off by his half-brothers, and uh, um, he started working with these mercenary associates. Um, I kind of wrote that wrong on there, but that's he had a bunch of fellas gather around him and they all went raiding and looting and plundering in this land of Tob. Tob was, uh, is where Syria is now, uh, kind of northeast of Israel. So in verse one, Jephthah is called a mighty warrior, um, just like when the angel of the Lord called Gideon in chapter six. Uh, he also, the angel, called Gideon a mighty warrior. In, the, in both passages, the mighty warrior suggests an aristocratic status, um, kind of held above others. Um, in this passage, the contrast is Jephthah's wealth and that it was not inherited like Gideon's was. Um, Jephthah stole and earned his wealth. After Jephthah was chased off by his half-brothers, he lived in Tob, I, I just told you that, which is Syria. And then the Ammonites start to build, uh, start to battle the Israelites and the elders of Gilead, head off to Tob to find Jephthah to get him to return and be commander of the Israelites. Um, he reminds them, hey, you're the ones that chased me off. What are you doing here asking me to come back? And then they up the ante, like I put there. The, not only do we want you to be commander, but we want you to lead us, be head over all of us. Because the title of commander is kind of a temporary thing where head is a permanent role. Um, he, he is going to be uh, their, their leader. Um, let's see. Okay. Helps if you push the right button. There we go. So Jephthah makes a deal with the elders before he'll go back with them. Um, if they take him home and uh, to fight the Ammonites and God gives the Ammonites over to him, if, he lets, if God lets them defeat the Ammonites, then he will remain and be their head, um, their ruler, in other words. And to conclude the negotiation, Jephthah says that the Lord will be the witness and will ratify the agreement. Um, he, he'll be, God will be the one that, that uh, says this is how it's going to be. <clears throat> Anything else in those verses that you have questions about or want to mention? Okay. 
Okay. 12 through 28. This is a pretty long passage. Just bear with me. Then Jephthah sent messengers to the king of the Ammonites and said, What is there between you and me that you have come to me to fight against my land? The king of the Ammonites answered the messengers of Jephthah, because Israel on coming out of coming from Egypt took away my land from the Arnon to the Jabbok and to the Jordan. Now therefore restore it peacefully, peaceably. Once again, Jephthah sent messengers to the king of the Ammonites and said to him, thus says Jephthah, Israel did not take away the land of Moab or the land of the Ammonites. But when they came up from, Israel, from Egypt, Israel went through the wilderness to the Red Sea and came to Kadesh. Israel then sent messengers to the king of Edom, saying, let us pass through your land. But the king of Edom would not listen. They also sent to the king of Moab, but he would not consent. So Israel remained in Kadesh. Then they journeyed through the wilderness, went around the land of Edom and the land of Moab, arrived on the east side of the land of Moab and camped on the other side of the Arnon. They did not enter the territory of Moab, for the Arnon was the boundary of Moab. Israel then sent messengers to King Sihon of the Amorites, king of Heshbon. And Israel said to him, let us pass through your land to our country. But Sihon did not trust Israel to pass through his territory. So Sihon gathered all his people together and encamped at Jahaz and fought with Israel. Then the Lord, the God of Israel, gave Sihon and all of his people into the hand of Israel, and they defeated them. So Israel occupied the land from, uh, of the Amorites who inhabited that country. They occupied all the ter territory of the Amorites from the Arnon to the Jabbok and from the wilderness to the Jordan. So now the Lord, yeah. So now the Lord, the God of Israel has conquered the Amorites for the benefit of his people, Israel. Do you intend to take their place? Should you not possess what your God, Shemosh, gives you to possess? And should we not be the ones to possess everything that the Lord our God has con conquered for our benefit? Now, are you any better than King Balak, son of Zippor of Moab? Did he ever enter into a conflict with Israel, or did he ever go to war with them? While Israel lived in Heshbon and its villages and in Aror and its villages and in all the towns that are along the Arnon 300 years, why did you not recover them within that time? It is not I who have sinned against you, but you are the one who, who does me wrong by making war on me. Let the Lord, who is judge, Decide today for the Israelites or for the Ammonites. But the king of the Ammonites did not heed the message that Jephthah, Jephthah sent him. All right. That's, that's a very brief history of the journey from Egypt to the promised land. Um. The Arnon and the Jabbok, I don't think I put this in the notes. The Arnon and the Jabbok are uh, rivers that start at the Jordan and work eastward uh, towards the wilderness. <clears throat> um, and the Ammonites now say that they own all of that property east of the Jordan, um, as far south as uh, it's almost close to the Dead Sea at the bottom of the Jordan is where the Arnon runs from and Jabbok is pretty close to the uh, Sea of Galilee at the top of the Jordan. I, I tried to find a map that I could put on here so you guys could see all this. I could not find a single map that listed all the different places that I wanted to point out. 
and uh, I didn't want to put an arrow on a space and say, now this is where this would have been if they added it to the map. Um, so the passage starts with the only instance of Israelite diplomacy in the entire book of Judges. Um, Jephthah decides he's going to send messengers to the king of the Ammonites and try and resolve the conflict uh, peaceably. And he asks a short question. He gets an equally short answer. Who are you that you come against me? Well, you took our property, so we're coming against you. Um, the king of the Ammonites feels the Israelites took land that belonged to the Ammonites and call for Jephthah to peacefully give the land back. When that doesn't work, Jephthah doesn't feel like he has to give this land up. He sends more messengers to recount the journey of the Israelites from Egypt to the promised land and how they used diplomacy when they came to certain territories, Edom and Moab asking permission to cross through those territories and how they only fought when diplomacy failed, which was with the king of Zihon. Um, the Israelites were attacked by Sihon, but God defeated them and the Israelites took the land that God gave them. At the end of the story, Jephthah kind of turns the tables on them because it's not the Ammonites who have been wronged for 300 years. They kind of sat on this and said, you know, we're just not going to mess with Israel. And now all of a sudden they've decided to come in and try and take their land back. Um, so it's the Israelites in Jephthah's eyes that have been wronged. Um, Jephthah turns the conflict over to God to decide, to judge. We're in the book of Judges to judge who gets this land and the king of the ammonites decides not to heed the message um, and i believe that they're headed into war to to battle anything in those passages you want to discuss or question 300 years is a long time to just now say something it is yeah, that, and that's exactly what Jephthah is trying to make a point of. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I see the boss sitting there beside you. All right. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's where I fell apart last week when I saw that the pastor was participating. <laughs> <laughs> no, you didn't. <laughs> uh, no, I didn't. All right, so the next passage is uh, 29 through 33. This is subtitled in my Bible, Jephthah's Vow. Um, we're going to find out even though Jephthah is a judge and God has called him to do, to deliver Israel, um, he's, he's not the best of examples of judges that we've had so far. Then the spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, and he passed through Gilead and Manasseh. He passed on to Mizpah of Gilead, and from Mizpah of Gilead, he passed on to the Ammonites. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will give the Ammonites into my hand, then whoever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me when I return victorious from the Ammonites shall be the Lord's to be offered up by me as a burnt offering. So Jephthah crossed over into the onto, crossed over to the Ammonites to fight against them. And the Lord gave them into his hand. He inflicted a massive defeat on them from Aror to the neighborhood of Mineth, 20 towns, and as far as Abel Karamim, so the Ammonites were, excuse me, were subdued before the people of Israel. All right. So this is not a good vow. Um, 
the the studies that I was using, the the commentaries and the notes that I was using, suggested that Jephthah used the wrong wording when he made this vow. We'll get to that. The passage begins by stating that the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah that he might have the strength of God um, to do the job that was set before him. So he was empowered by the Lord for the job that lies ahead. Um, we've talked in the past that this, uh, this wording, the Spirit of the Lord, um, kind of, uh, it, it's more of a supernatural um, exp explanation of something uh, you know, they, he's, he was empowered to do something supernaturally. In this instance, he traveled uh, a great distance, um, probably in a short amount of time, though it didn't actually say that. Um, let's see. All right, so that that line of, of scripture the the spirit of the lord came upon jephthah the lord graciously empowered jephthah jephthah for war on behalf of his people but it does not mean that all the warriors decisions were god's of god's wisdom he didn't he didn't empower him with wisdom so much as the ability to defeat the ammonites and because of this jephthah makes a very rash vow in verses 31, 30 and 31. Uh, I'll read that. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord. Um, now, this was a custom that generals did to uh, not just Israelite ge uh, um, generals, but commanders throughout all of the, the land. They vowed to their gods to offer up uh, an offering if, they're de if they defeated their foes. Um, and so that's what Jephthah is doing. He's, he's just following tradition and uh, telling God what he's going to offer when he gets back victorious. But he has that, fa that tragic flaw. He, he likes to make deals. You know, he, was, he was trying to work out deals with the king of the Ammonites when he first sent the messengers you know, kind of a, can we work this out peacefully type of thing, but he's making a deal with God here. He hastily says, whoever comes out of my house, though he probably should have said, whatever, and this is where the commentary came in. The standard plans of Iron Age houses, the, the houses in this era, accommodated livestock as well as family. Jephthah is not thinking that maybe a person's going to walk out of his house. I think he's expecting an animal to come out um, because that's what the Israelites did. They sacrificed animals, livestock. Um, and because of the spirit of the Lord, Jephthah defeats the Ammonites. And we're going to find out the the what happens with the vow, the consequences of the vow in the next passage. Anything in this passage before we move on? Okay. All right, so this one is, this one is subtitled Jephthah's daughter. When Jephthah came to his home at Mizpah and, and there was his daughter, then, I'm sorry, then Jephthah came to his home in Mizpah and there was his daughter coming out to meet him with timbrels and with dancing. She was, the only, she was his only child. He had no son or daughter except her. When he saw her, he tore his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, you have brought me very low. You have become the cause of great trouble to me. For I have opened my mouth to the Lord, and I cannot take back my vow. She said to him, my father, if you have opened your mouth to the Lord, do to me according to what has gone out of your mouth. Now that the Lord has given you vengeance against your enemies, the Ammonites. And she said to her father, to her father let this thing be done for me. Grant me two months so that I may go and wander on the mountains and bewail my virginity. 
my companions and I. Go, he said, and sent her away for two months. So she bewailed, I'm sorry, so she departed, she and her companions, and bewailed her virginity on the mountains. At the end of two months, she returned to her father, who did with her according to the vow he had made. She had never slept with a man. So there arose an Israelite custom that for four days every year, the daughters of Israel would go out to lament the daughter of Jephthah the Gileadite. Consequences. Um, so we'll start off by saying human sacrifice is known to the Israelites, but they don't do it. They don't, they don't condone it. They don't practice it. Um, so when Jethah comes home and see, sees his daughter coming out of the house, carrying, you know, a, a tambourine, that's what I was trying to come up with. Timbrel is a, like a tambourine, um, dancing and singing. She's doing what she's supposed to do. That, that was the traditional role of, of the woman, um, singing after the victory, dancing, uh, playing music to welcome the victor home. Um, and you may, re you may re remember Deborah doing the same thing back in chapter five. Um, there were specific verses that the whole chapter was called the song of Deborah. There were specific verses that, uh, praised the victors. Um, Barak was the, the victor's name from that chapter. Um, and that's, that song of Deborah is a great example of this tradition we're talking about. So once the vow is made to God, it is irrevocable. And Jephthah's daughter speaks wisdom to him. Um, you know, she, she says, you've promised God this. You've got to carry it out. Um, but before you do, let me go off into the mountains and lament my virginity. To die a virgin was to die childless. And this was a terrible thing in this culture, uh, often called a great misfortune. So uh, she asks for the two months to mourn her childless death with her friends. She knows what's coming. And uh, an interesting point that I, I wanted to make was that, remember it said this Jephthah's daughter was his only child. So with the sacrifice, he also becomes childless. That was just something that my study Bible, the notes pointed out. And then the sacrifice is covered in less than one verse um, because the details are just too terrible to elaborate on. Um, at the end of the two months, she returned to her father who did, who did with her according to the vow he had made. And that's it. Um, which is very strange for the Old Testament because usually they go into all the blood and guts and gore. Um, but again, um, because of the sacrifice and because she died childless, um, the tragedy is tempered first by the company of her friends. You know, it, it is a tragedy, but it's made a little better, uh, not a little better. Uh, anyway, it's kind of bookended with good stuff. Her friends go with her and lament her childless death. And then afterwards, after the sacrifice, um, they create this ceremony, this, this, um, this thing that they do, the yearly ceremony of remembrance to honor her. Now, this ceremony is not mentioned again in scripture, and except for the for verse 40 that's the only time we see it and it is otherwise unknown in jewish culture so somewhere through the years it got lost and jewish people today don't practice it don't don't realize that it even exists um except for the that one verse 
The most startling feature of this art narrative is that there's no condemnation of Jephthah's sacrifice of his daughter to God. No one tells him this is a bad thing. Maybe you should break your vow or... Um, <coughs> and all of this is the rescue that completes that cycle that we've been working on, the apostasy, hardship, moaning, and then rescue. What do you think? Anything that we need to discuss from this chapter or questions that have arisen? Jim, I've got an interesting um, note in my study Bible. Yes. I'll just go ahead and read it to you. Um, having made an impulsive vow, Jephthah now compounded his folly by blaming the result on the daughter and failing to respond in light of scripture. Vows taken were usually inviolable. Um, that's Numbers 32. But mm -hmm. the Old Testament recognizes a few circumstances under which an unwise vow could be set aside. And that's Numbers 30. And okay. If human sacrifice was forbidden in the law, a substitute could have been made. That's Leviticus 27. Jephthah was apparently unaware of these principles because maybe his upbringing or the area was far from Israel's major centers. So she probably didn't have to die. Right. Okay. I didn't get any of those references in my study. That not that something? Okay. Uh, that's a, yeah, I've got the that's New Living Translation. Too. Okay. Wow. That's well, what I, I have may... too. New Living. Okay. Yeah. Well, I need to find a different study Bible, I guess. It's leaving out stuff. <laughs> I know we're not supposed to add I wonder to why scripture. nobody like suggested that. Like, I mean, why did nobody be like, hey man, are you sure about this? Like, you yeah. know what I mean? Like, even his wife, like, why was yeah. his wife like not say, I don't know, it's just weird. Yeah, it's like, can't you look into this or something? Because if <laughs> yeah, like don't go to the, <laughs> the hills and cry, like yeah, yeah, like go research it and find out if you can live. Right. That's crazy. It is. Um, mm. and, and there, there was something in there that you mentioned, Bethany, that kind of stuck with me, and now I've lost it. Um, it was right at the beginning of what you were um, reading he, to us. He blamed it on his daughter. Yeah, he blamed. That was it. I, I didn't oh, catch that yeah. when I read the scripture didn't he he blamed his daughter for her own death that's yeah. that was interesting too it's not my fault mm -hmm. you shouldn't have come out of the house that, right you're supposed to send the cows out first <laughs> man anything else that you found yeah my translation my translation says when he sees her for the first time he says you have completely destroyed me you've brought disaster on me oh wow okay so he is yeah he's blaming her yeah well, I mean, it was similar what i read i mean he tore his clothes and said alas mm -hmm. my daughter you have brought me very low you've become a cause of great trouble yeah. to me but that's not near the language that you you just read hmm well, we certainly know Jephthah had his problems. He shouldn't have made the vow in the first place. Um, it wasn't something God required to uh, empower him to go to war with the Ammonites. God had already done that. But I guess maybe it's like a bragging thing that, you know, now that you've empowered me, look what I'm able to do. I don't know. Anything else? Well, oh, it says my battery. That's about just crazy. I'm just okay. going, I mean, it was just crazy. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> <laughs>